All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Organizers Forum. I am really excited for today's call. Um, for those that are new to the Organizers Forum, it is a monthly video call that we do to explore community organizing in disability communities, to bring people together to talk about what is working, what can we be doing better, how do we support each other to really build a voice among disabled people, um, and how do we really expand disability organizing to make sure that it is, it's anti-racist and fully inclusive and that we deal with oppression within our own communities. Um, and the Organizers Forum is a project of the National Disability Leadership Alliance, which is a national um, cross-disability coalition of disability organizations working to build more of a voice for disability communities. So I wanna introduce myself. I am Jessica Lehman. Um, I lead the Organizers Forum. Um, I work as executive director of Senior and Disability Action, which is in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, I identify as a white, disabled, queer, Jewish woman. Um, and uh, my, my visual description, um, so I'm, I'm in my mid 40s. Um, I have shoulder length, um, straight brown hair, and um, my, my background is a, a Van Gogh of, of cypresses with some blues and greens. And I'm, I'm wearing a, a green top um, with a, a scarf. I don't know if you can tell, but it has some ladybugs on it. Um, and where did my notes go? Here we go. Um, so as far as some access notes today, um, we have live captioning and ASL. Um, the ASL should be spotlighted. If you have any trouble, let us know um, in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself if any other access issues come up. Um, as far as the captioning, you can go to the bottom of your screen or it might be in the corner if you're on a smartphone or a tablet and choose show subtitle. Um, and I'm gonna ask if um, Casey, who has offered to help with tech today can put that in the, the chat just to let people know to do that. Um, so I wanna remind people to speak slowly and clearly and say your name before you speak. The, um, for the organizers forum, we are working to really build connections with each other too, right? So people can reach out, get to know each other. So be as present as you feel comfortable with. Um, turn on your video if that works for you. If it doesn't, that's okay too. Um, we will ask people to keep yourself muted if you have background noise, but if not, feel free to unmute and you know you can you can share your oohs and ahs um, about what our speakers have to say today. Um, I hope that you clicked on the link to sign up for joining today's call and be added to the listserv. Um, if not, if you're not sure you're on the listserv and you want to be, feel free to put your email in the chat and I'll add you. And um, speaking of the chat, so we, we do leave it on because that's a, a good way for a lot of people um, to be able to share thoughts and ideas and keep it accessible. Um, but we will read out things that come up in the chat um, and we will share things later as well. So that um, if the chat is not accessible to you, we'll make sure you get that, that content. Okay, so um, what else? Um, we know that an hour is never enough to cover these topics and especially with um, a mistake with the link, we're, we're a little bit shorter on time today. So um, we try to continue the discussion in a couple ways. Um, we have our, our listserv disability organizing at googlegroups.com. And then we're also on Facebook as organizers forum, just like it, it looks um, or like it sounds. So um, please go to Facebook and be sure to like that. And you can open up um, the Facebook page during the call today if that works for you and put in some comments about things people say that stand out to you, thoughts and questions that you have so that we can respond to each other that way. And the recording and the transcript, transcript of this call will be available um, on SDA's website, which is sdaction.org. Um, and we will share that link later as well. So I am excited to jump into today's topic. Um, at the beginning of the year, we often do a little bit of a 
take a step back from the, the work that we're in and really think about where are we in terms of disability organizing? What kind of power have we built? What's working? What's not? What do we envision for 2022? And so I am really excited that we have three incredible leaders in our community with us today to share their thoughts and, and ideas. Um, and so we'll have a bit of a, a conversation for, um, well, since we're started late, um, we'll do 20, 25 minutes of that. And then we'll have some Q&A and some time to hear from other people on the call as well. So let me go ahead and introduce our speakers. Um, yeah, and I'm gonna spotlight them as they, as they come up. Um, so first we're gonna hear from, um, well, actually it's a conversation. So um, one of our, our panelists is Rayma McCoy-McDade, who's the executive director of the National Council on Independent Living. And Rayma previously served in the Biden-Harris administration as commissioner for the Administration on Disabilities within the Administration for Community Living, ACL. And before that, she was executive director of the Central Iowa Center for Independent Living. Um, a lot of people may know that she ran for state legislature and is the first openly autistic person to have run for state legislature in US history. Um, and Rayma speaks regularly about the intersection of race and disability at universities, organizations, and corporations. So welcome, Rayma. We're really excited to have you. Actually, let me go ahead and turn it over to you to give your visual description. This is Rima. Thank you, Jessica, um, for uh, organizing these events and, and for allowing me to participate in this one in particular. I, um, I really appreciate that. Um, my name, I actually got married, um, and so my name has changed. It's Rima McCoy Heighton, um, and I, uh, she, her pronouns. I am a black woman, early 40s. I've got large natural hair. I'm wearing uh, large uh, plastic tortoiseshell glasses with some orange flare on them, um, and I'm wearing a, a sweater with a bunch of cats on it. And behind me, I'm in my seated in my home office. I've got various pieces of artwork behind me. And with that, I'll hand it back to Jessica. Thank you so much, Rima. Um, and congratulations on getting married. And I apologize for missing the name change. So thanks for explaining that. So um, next, I want to introduce Dessa Cosma. Um, Dessa grew up in the Deep South and has been a social justice activist for as long as she can remember, she says, um, starting her environmental LGBTQ and reproductive justice efforts in high school. She has worked as a field organizer for Planned Parenthood Affiliates of Michigan, program director and trainer for the Center for Progressive Leadership, and executive director of the Economic Justice Alliance of Michigan, which she helped to start in collaboration with some of Detroit's most dedicated economic and racial justice champions. In 2018, Dessa started Detroit Disability Power, which she is currently executive director of, um, to grow the organizing power of the disability community and to continue bridging the gap between disability communities and larger social justice movements. And she has particular interest in disability focused political work that is grounded in anti racism and economic justice. And Dessa, go ahead and describe yourself. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for having me. I'm Dessa. Thanks for the introduction, Jessica. Um, I am a white woman in my late 30s with long blonde hair um, sitting in my dining room. And I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much. And our third panelist is Nikki Brown Booker. Nikki is the program officer for the Disability Inclusion Fund at Borealis Philanthropy. Um, as a person with a disability and a biracial woman, Nikki says she has been interested in the intersection of disability justice and racial justice for a long time. She previously worked as executive director for Easy Does It Emergency Services, a nonprofit in the San Francisco Bay Area that provides emergency attendant care, wheelchair repair and transportation for people with disabilities and seniors in Berkeley. And she's also a leader in Hand in Hand, the Domestic Employers Network, um, through which she helped pass the California Domestic Workers Bill of Rights. Welcome, Nikki. Thanks, Jessica. 
So I am, my audio description is I'm a, a brown skinned woman wearing um, glasses with a shoulder length curly black hair. I'm wearing a green sweater dress and my background are, uh, is my office. There's a couple of pictures in the background and an open door. Um, and I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much. So I'm gonna throw out some questions for our panelists and um, some of them I'll, I'll ask somebody to speak first and you all can, can jump in as you like. Um, we, are, we are pretty informal over here. I hope that works for everybody. Um, so I wanna start with a question. What are you excited about right now in terms of disability organizing? What do you see out there in your own community or anywhere in the country that, that you think is really working? And uh, maybe we'll start with Rima on that one. This is Rima, goodness. Um, <laughs> what am I excited about? Well, uh, I, I think I'm probably gonna answer this question in, in a way that's a little bit different from, from what you may be anticipating, Jessica. So. Uh, not not trying to throw a curveball into things, um, but we had in 2021 as a country we embarked on uh, some really critical conversations about what's being what has come to be known as the Great Resignation. Um, people are looking at the work that they do um, uh, if if they have the privilege to look at the work that they do differently um, in in the context of is this fulfilling um, is this uh, uh, helping supporting me to meet my own personal mission vision values as far as my life is concerned and if that's not the case uh, people are moving on. Um, and, and so, you know, primarily the great resignation has centered in the service industry, uh, restaurants, that kind of thing, uh, retail. What I think is uh, looming on the horizon uh, for the nonprofit sector, where a lot of us are doing disability organizing and advocacy, is the great resignation part two. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I think this is good news. And so just stay with me for a second. You know, people in, in our sector are looking around and and or they're or they're they're coming into the sector with lots of goals and aspirations and are being met with a lot of what those of us who've been entrenched in, in the nonprofit sector and disability organizing for a long, long time have been kind of uh, slogging through for a long, long time. Uh, you know, the uh, dealing with uh, uh, the juxtaposition of our ideals in in the face of reality. Ah, and uh, you know, historically, uh, you know, the generation that that preceded us, as far as these types of conversations are concerned, to a certain extent, kind of sucked it up and said, you know, the ends justify the means. What we are. On the standing on the precipice of is uh, people that are are younger than me, uh, millennials and and Gen Z and whatnot who are entering into the workforce, uh, full of full of ambition, full of desire to really truly be the change, so so to speak, um, and are being met with people that are older than me, uh, who identify as being radical incrementalists and that kind of thing who you know want to crush dreams and uh, and that kind of thing and the people that are younger than me are saying fuck that shit um i i don't want my dreams of making this world a better place not only for me but for the generations that follow me uh, to fall by the wayside because some funder is afraid of the fact that uh, all white people are racist. And so people are taking their, their mission, personal mission, vision, and values elsewhere. Um, I think that this is a good thing because the fact of the matter is, is that um, the ends do not justify the means. The ends are the means. And if we can't get the, 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 the needs met, um, in in our spaces, then you know the needs still need to be met, and you know that can 
perhaps sound a little bit provocative uh, to the folks that, that are here with us this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you're at. But the fact of the matter is, is that if you are really, if we're really truly devoted to the work, to uh, ensuring that, uh, you know, anti-racism ultimately prevails, anti-ableism, um, et cetera, et cetera, then we need to look above and beyond the precious little edifices and, 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 and uh, you know, institutions that we've created um, and, uh, and, and not care so much about where the work gets done and be more, more focused on ensuring that the work ultimately gets done. And so that, is what excites me um, as I embark upon my own journey as far as all of that's concerned in 2022. Thank you so much. Provocative is, is great. Dessa, sorry, go ahead. I saw you unmute yourself. Uh, yeah, this is Dessa. I just, I got eager to, to chime in because I really like what Rima's saying and it's it's connected to what I was going to say, but, um, but was a great, I don't, I, I mean, I couldn't agree more. And I think we have a lot of internal conversations about like the way we frame what you just talked about is, is the way we do the work is the work, um, which is all about it not being about just the ends, but about being the means. And the, and, and to somebody's point in the chat, um, the uh, ends are the means. I mean, I think that's a really important reminder for those of us doing social change work. Like what are the myriad ways that we can model better ways of being of more, uh, equitable, what some people would call like radical <laughs> dissension from the way things are currently being done, which is exactly what's needed. And I do see a lot of excitement in that. And I think COVID has, as we all know, like provided many opportunities for reflection um, about these things. And I think it's related to what I was going to share is something that gives me hope as, you know, <laughs> as an organizer and, and doing this kind of thing, like I would have to I have to be an eternal optimist. Like I have to find the the hope and optimism um, every day, even though it's not always evident to keep going. And I think, so sometimes I'm like, wow, am I like, am I thinking of something as being positive just because like the bar is really low? <laughs> you know, like sometimes I get caught up on my own, like, should I be happy about this? Or this is like the bare minimum, but I'm still happy because it's better than what we had yesterday or something, right? So you all know that feeling, I'm sure. Uh, so the thing, the thing that gives me hope, though, you all can help me decide if it fits into that category. Um, I see that non-disabled people, at least in my sphere, which of course is limited <laughs> um, and somewhat curated by the type of work that I do and the kind of people I'm around, um, I see attention to disability, ableism, uh, accessibility and accommodations more at the forefront of people's minds in our social justice circles than I have seen before. And I don't want to say we're doing like excellently in that way because we have a long way to go. Um, but I, I, I do think that there's this, this question that Rima's bringing up about like, why aren't we doing it better? Like none of this, none of these BS excuses anymore. Um, I see that attitude like helping push us to get better inclusion and better access and better accommodations and better political analysis. Um, and I and obviously like the technology that's come along with this kind of like a, a lot of people working from home thing has really helped. And so um, I, I see hope in that people are people are seeing, I think people are seeing us more as a constituency and more as a group of people who, who uh, should be included for all sorts of reasons. And I think, um, I don't wanna overstate how well that's going, but I do think, I, I have noticed a shift in the last couple of years and that gives me hope because I really am a, I'm really a big tent kind of person in terms of like, let's build some power, which requires numbers uh, and re it requires strategy. Um, and for us to be, us as disabled people, to be in positions where we can influence um, how things are, decisions that are getting made, whether they're in disability only spaces or in kind of mixed spaces, our ability to show up and participate is really critical. And so the attention I'm seeing to us being able to show up and participate isn't a big thing. It should be the standard. And yet the consequence of us being able to show up and participate could have 
and, and will have like pretty massive impacts as far as I can see. So that gives me hope. Thank you, I love that. Go ahead, Nikki. Uh, wow, there are such so many good things <laughs> there in all in both of those discussions. Um, so I think the thing that brings me um, the most hope right now is, um, and it's also probably because from the perspective that I'm coming from of being a funder and um, seeing the work that's being done across the country. Um, you know, before I was really very Bay Area focused and now I'm really seeing what's happening across the country um, is how much the disability community is really starting to embrace the idea of intersectionality, particularly where race is concerned, um, and that organizations are, uh, I think a lot of disability organizations really were like, just focus on disability, staying in their lane um, in the past, and like, not really, you know, broadening that perspective. And um, I'm seeing that just that intersectionality piece really starting to be embraced in a way that I've never seen in the past. I've heard I've heard organizations talk about it, but not actually do it. And, and the first time, and I think I'm actually seeing organizations, particularly nonprofit organizations, actually really grappling with how they do that and wanting and really committing to doing that work. Um, and, um, you know, as a funder, you know, we just had our, we just gave out, you know, like 2.6 million and we had this big RFP uh, last year. And, um, uh, you know, we got 180 applications and from organizations that um, were, and by and large, most of the organizations were really thinking about how they were, embracing um, intersectionality um, and um, and it was was really uh, heartening to see that happening um, and yeah, I mean there are definitely uh, you know that wasn't necessarily across the board but just seeing that work being done across the country um, and, and in areas that you know I was I was a little surprised by like, small pockets of the Midwest uh, in, in southern US states. Um, and then the other thing I really wanted to say about what brings me a lot of hope is that to see the like just the these small young um, organizations that are literally like they're just starting and they're they're starting with that frame, that perspective in mind from the very, from the ground up, which, you know, traditionally, I mean, as we all know, a lot of the this, uh, long-term disability organizations that have been around forever, that was not the, that was not in their perspective, from, you know, and now um, I see like, just like that is starting to be embraced and that new organizations are thinking about it from, from the very beginning. Um, and which is just really, which gives me hope for what our future could look like in terms of organizing for people with disabilities. That is really encouraging. Thank you for that. Um, I wonder, I'm wondering if we can hear about some specific either groups or projects or campaigns that are, that are doing organizing in disability communities that are building power like, can you name one specific thing that you want to see more of? And that's for any of you. This is Rima. Um, I, I, I could, but I, I, I want to bring attention to, um, you know, what, what has been really stunning to me in, in, a, in the best possible way as far as organizing is concerned over the past few years. And that has been watching folks um, 
uh, organize themselves and allow others to join them via the power of social media. And so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to take away the the power of nonprofit organizations or that kind of thing. But you know, ultimately, um, you know, if we if we want real change to happen, it really needs to happen at the individual level. You know, this this era of oh, the organizations will take care of that stuff for us. We're beyond that now. Um, and so, you know, watching disabled folks, particularly black and brown disabled folks, um, become social media influencers um, and, and really, uh, you know, just individually, independently amass followers and power and, and um, bring, bring a lot of weight to, to, to situations, opportunities, that kind of thing through the, the, the power of being a, a social media influencer has been really illuminating for me as somebody who uh, is pretty late to the game as far as social media is concerned. And a lot of the folks that I've had opportunity to talk to who identify as social media influencers in the disability community, you know, more often than not, they tell me that they came in, they fell into social media organizing after having really negative experiences uh, with nonprofit organizations, particularly some of the old guard organizations, um, and reached a point where they said, you know what, to hell with it, I'm gonna do it myself. Um, and, and so, you know, I, 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 I just wanna make sure that although we're talking about organizing as far as um, organizations and 501c3s are concerned, um, that, that, that that doesn't get lost in this very important conversation as well. Thank you for that, Rima. This is Jessica. I, I totally agree with all of that. And, um, and it reminds me of a, a very recent example of the director of the CDC, um, Dr. Walensky, making a comment about it being, quote unquote, encouraging that most of the people dying from Omicron are people with with other health conditions or multiple health conditions, and um, and so it was it was individuals who really took to Twitter and started a Twitter storm about it. Um, Imani Barberin, um, a disabled person of color with a lot of social media followers, who started the hashtag "My Disabled Life Is Worthy," right, and got other people to share stories and really got the CDC to start paying attention and realize how they had messed up. And I think that that's an example of exactly the, the kind of power building you're talking about. Jester and Nikki, do you have other um, examples you'd like to share? Uh, this is Dessa, unless you're about to speak, Nikki. No, I was, I was just gonna comment on the Lewinsky uh, uh, whatever tobacco, whatever you want to call it. Um, I know uh, at uh, the organization that I belong to, Borealis, that where several of the funds um, are are coming together to write an open letter to Walensky about that comment, and that it's not just about not even just about people with disabilities, but about also people of color who, you know, you know, essentially she has basically said that, you know, it's okay that they're dying, but not that, you know, it's like, really, <laughs> are we still there? And uh, yeah, so that's something that we're working on. Yeah, this is Dessa. I mean, something that, you know, I, I'm kind of a broken record and uh, about this, about what I'm about to say, which is like, I'm really interested in, in building a cross issue, cross community, cross disability power. Uh, and so anything I see that is a, a going in that direction makes me happy and excited. Um, it's, um, it's hard. It, it's hard work, right? It doesn't happen overnight, and it's always starts and stops. And uh, we still lose really important campaigns, even when we do all the things right. So, like, I'm not. I don't have Pollyanna vibes on this, but um, I do. I do see. Um, I do think it's important for us to think about how are we building power with 
other people who are marginalized by the same systems of oppression that we may individually be marginalized by, um, and seeing the connections across the systems of oppression in a way that like politicizes us to build these cross issue, cross community movements. Um, and um, you know, as was shared in the bio that you you uh, read, Jessica, when you introduced me. I'm really interested in like bridging this gap and de-siloing disability because uh, we, you know, we we are large. We know that we're very diverse. We know that uh, as a constituency, uh, and there's a lot of work to do to get non-disabled people to understand us as a constituency. I think, um, but the fact is, um, the the fact is that we're going to get free by working with everyone who's trying to get free. It's not a thing that we, I don't think we can do it alone. I don't, I don't think that's, I don't think it's possible. It's certainly not um, even necessarily in line with a lot of our values around uh, collaboration and intersectionality to try to do it alone. So, um, you know, I, I think in terms of strategy, building relationships as disabled people, as disabled organizations with each other, like we're doing here, but also with non-disabled folks and non-disability focused organizations that are actually winning things or trying, um, building relationships so that we can insert and teach them to have their own disability justice analysis. So that if they're doing, um, I don't know, if, if they're doing housing stuff, for example, devoid of a disability analysis, their housing work would be much better if we were there, um, not only for disabled people, but for the sake of the work in general. And so just like us, um, it, and it has to go both ways, right? But like us uh, building relationships intentionally to build power across marginalized communities, I think is the best strategy. Thank you everyone, that's powerful. Um, the next question is, is really related to what Dessa was saying. Um, so I know you partially answered this, but I wanted to ask, how do you, how do you think we are doing at building power in disability communities? Do you think that policymakers at the local, state, and federal levels listen to us? Um, and what, what can we do or what should we do to build a stronger voice? This is Dessa. I can speak since I was kind of going in that direction. Um, my my honest assessment is I think we're getting there. <laughs> that's my uh, that's my very honest assessment. I mean, we're starting to think at a larger scale is one of the things that I see us doing, like starting to have like strategic campaigns that are looking beyond maybe our own memberships or our own small sphere of influence to something bigger uh, to to reach more people with a, a message or an ask or an action uh, in a coordinated way with other groups. Like I see us starting to do that, which is exciting. So the scale thing, um, I do see us um, starting to work better across disability and across issues. Although again, we still have room for that, but I see us going that direction. And to me, those things are all the ingredients for building power. So I, I think we're getting there. Um, I think we need to always be more explicit that we're trying to build power. Like, I think we need to talk about power every time we open our mouth. Uh, and I think power building needs to be at the forefront of every strategy. And the reason I say this is um, we're not getting shit without being in control of our own lives. Like, it's just not happening. It's never happened. <laughs> um, I, I, again, sound like a broken record, but Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing without demand, never has and never will. Um, that's certainly true for us, right? How else could we be the biggest uh, marginalized group in the country and still be so poorly treated uh, because we don't have enough power? Uh, so power is, power is not just a numbers game, but there's definitely a numerical component. Uh, and there's, a, there's, a, there's obviously a values component. There's always an, obviously an action component. Um, so I, I do, I think we're getting there, uh, but we got to keep being really explicit and really intentional about it. Uh, I don't think we're adequately considered at all. <laughs> um, I think we're anything but adequately considered, uh, which is all the more reason to continue building power. Uh, and then the last thing I could say about this is just that, you know, my, um, my assessment and the way that Detroit Disability Power 
um, thinks about social change is we really try to approach it from four levels. So uh, to Rima's point, the like, well, sort of Rima's point, the personal level, uh, what kind of personal transformation do we need to go through and engage in to be the best actor that we can be in this world in this moment? Uh, that means dismantling our own biases. That means learning and growing and reflecting. Uh, we also need to approach it from an interpersonal perspective, how we treat each other. And this goes back to the earlier point around like uh, the way we do the work is the work or the, you know, the ends are the means. Um, and then there's the institutional level, which is, you know, changing laws and policies and institutional practices. And then there's the cultural level, which is, you know, the art and music and, and things that portray us as full humans with something to offer, right? So my, my sense is that we have to work on all four of those levels if we're serious about building power because they all relate to each other in a way that means if we're just working on one, it's, it's we're gonna be left, uh, I don't know, we're just not gonna get there as, as much. That's, that's my analysis at least. That was pretty amazing, thank you for that that uh, very comprehensive explanation of, of building power. Um, Nikki or Rima, do you wanna say something about what you think we should do to build a stronger voice, build power? Um, I mean, I think Jessica really said it very well. I think the only thing that I would add to that is I think that part of building power is really calling people out also. Like, you know, like, like the Walensky in, in, issue or anything else that kind of comes up. Um, you know, in like uh, social media or in like the, you know, the media in general that um, that just really just seems, you know, not that they're not think, taking a disability perspective or thinking about like that this could, that this actually really is a, a disability issue um, needs to be called out. I think, I think COVID has really brought that, um, you know, to the forefront, like um, I think before COVID, like a lot of the issues around and surrounding health, our healthcare system, you know, it's just people were kind of just moving along and not really paying attention. And I think that COVID really brought out that we need to actually really think about how how our healthcare system is not really addressing anybody well, anybody honestly, and particularly people with disabilities. Um, and seniors. So um, I just think that, you know, calling people out is definitely a way to get, you know, people to notice and to actually maybe think a little deeper about what it is that they're saying and doing. Thanks, Nikki. Um, Rima, I'm, I'm going to ask you to start with this next question, which I know you're going to like. Um, it's how do you think disability communities are doing at addressing racism and white supremacy and other forms of oppression, but that may be too much to tackle right now um, within our groups? And what what do you think we need? What do disability organizers need to be doing differently? This is Rima. Woo! Um, <laughs> where do I begin? Uh, so Nikki noted the, the power of calling out um, you know, when people are, are not taking the disability community seriously, um, you know, I've kind of made a name for myself or become a little bit notorious for um, focusing my calling out within the community um, to, to varying degree with varying degrees of success or, or not. Um, but here's the deal, and uh, my comment's probably going to place me in the doghouse, and that's okay, um, because it's a conversation that needs to be breached, and I'm going to breach it, and then I actually have to go, because I, I have another meeting at, at 2 o'clock Eastern. Here's the deal. The disability rights movement, particularly the disability-led rights movement, that includes the independent living movement, is rooted in anti-Blackness. How so, some of you are thinking, how can this be? Here's the deal. Black folks started to attain a modicum of success as far as the Black civil rights movement is concerned in the 60s, okay? White folks, more often than not, 
financially well off, who experienced physical disabilities, saw those successes and said things like, black people are tired of sitting in the back of the bus. We are tired of not being able to get onto the bus. That's an actual quote from the disability community, from the disability led community. Here's another one. Martin Luther King didn't march for you is something that black folks who are disabled in this space, like myself, here on a regular basis, okay? White folks with physical disabilities, somewhat well, well off financially speaking, saw the successes of the black civil rights movement and said, if our maids and our janitors and our nannies are getting those rights, then you know we deserve to be centered as far as rights are concerned too. And a lot of appropriation or appreciation perhaps as far as the, 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 the mechanisms of the black civil rights movement was undertaken by white folks with physical disabilities and presto, you had the independent living movement or the disability led civil rights movement. You could, I mean, you could hear it in those early slogans, those the, the, and the, the rallies of the early days of the independent living movement, actual chants and slogans from the black civil rights movement, reworded, revamped, and uh, rehashed for the, the masses that attended these events. And that led into you know, a modicum of success for the independent living movement, disability-led civil rights movement. And, uh, and you had folks that you know, were at the, at the helm of those movements, all white, and, and if they weren't white, they were swiftly forgotten as far as disability history is concerned. And, you know, move forward with the momentum that, you know, led to the creation of hundreds of centers for independent living, statewide independent living councils, uh, you know, the Americans with Disabilities Act, Olmstead decision, all this wonderful stuff. And, uh, you know, the folks that were at the helm of, of, of those movements, they got their rights. You know, they attain, attain success. Some of them are considered, you know, icons, not just of the disability community, but of the mainstream community. And so mission accomplished, right? No, you know, there are entire populations of folks in the disability community who don't know about Centers for Independent Living, or if they do know about them, have gone to them and experienced anti-Blackness or other manifestations of racism. Uh, you know, uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, the Olmstead decision, you know, do not take into account entire populations of disabled folks. And so, you know, the struggle continues for many of us but for those of us in the community for whom the struggle ended with the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, they're looking at folks like me who are like, hey, let's talk about the anti-Blackness in this space. And they're like, get out. We don't want you here. You're divisive. How dare you? We're focusing on disability. That's how we're going to unite. Not taking into account the stunning fact that to be Black and disabled creates a wholly different experience than to be white and disabled. My black autistic experience is very different from the you know, white suburban autistic experience of the 15 year old boy who's you know, hanging out in his parents' basement playing World of Warcraft or whatever the kids are playing these days. And my community does not take that into consideration. We're so focused on the situational that and 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 you know well I personally have never called anybody the N word so that means that you know I'm not a part of the problem. We're so focused on the situational that we refuse to work at look at the systemic and the systemic the 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 inconvenient truth is that the foundation that we all work from, even those of us who feel comfortable talking about anti racism and that kind of thing, the foundation is rooted in anti-blackness, it's rooted 
and racism. And until we come to terms with that, and until we repent, we will only go so far. There are wings of the movement that are moving forward and they are led by people again, who are younger than me. And I wish them the absolute best, but there are wings of this movement that historically are led by people that are older than me and they are dying on the vine, whether or not they're cognizant of it. And I say that as executive director of the National Council on Independent Living, although the views and opinions that I'm expressing at this time are mine and mine alone. We need to repent. We need to have serious conversations about anti-racism and what its implications are and what each of our individual and collective roles and responsibilities are to ensure that the, the, the roots of, this, of these spaces that we inhabit are addressed and healed so that we can move forward. Otherwise, the talent that, that finds itself in these spaces is going to see the rot and it's going to, they're going to say, fuck this, we're out. And they're gonna move on with their mission, vision and values intact, mind you. And so the work will still get done. It just won't get done here. And so I got to move on to my next meeting. And so sorry to leave you all here with this, but uh, I, I, again, Jessica, I thank you for organizing this. Um, this is wonderful conversation. And I wish everyone in this space the absolute best in, in your endeavors as far as moving the disability community forward. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Rima. That was actually the the perfect um, ending to our call today. And um, and I'm sorry, I wish we had another hour. I'm sure you all do. Um, I see Dessa raising her hand. Did you want to make it? Okay. I was just, I was just saying, yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Um, huge thanks to Dessa and Nikki and Rima for being here today and sharing your thoughts and insights. Um, thank you to all of our participants. We obviously did not have time to get to Q&A, um, but if folks want to share comments and questions on Facebook or email me, um, we, can, we can continue some of that discussion. And um, please, please mark your calendars for um, Tuesday, February 15th at the same time. Um, this will be our follow-up discussion. Um, and so we will have a chance for all of you who participated in the call who didn't have a chance to speak, we'll do small groups to really think about what do we do with everything we heard, right? I think um, Rima gave us a very clear call to action. How are we addressing that in our own organizing at local, state, and federal levels? Um, and what, what are the issues that we should be organizing around, right? To Jessa and Nikki's point about doing more cross-sector organizing, cross-community organizing. How do, we, how do we work with other groups? Um, there's a huge voting rights movement going on right now, for example, right? What are we doing to make sure that disability communities are acting in solidarity to other groups and making sure that we're building power for, for all marginalized people? So there's a lot of questions to talk about. I really hope you can join us on February 15th. Um, and uh, thank you also to our ASL interpreters, Kat and Norma, and to our um, captioner, Nicole from 2020 Captioning. And uh, I think that that covers it. Dessa or Nikki, do you have any um, closing thoughts? No, thank you so much. This is really a great conversation. I see a lot of um, thank yous in the, in the chat. Um, I also noticed Rhea shared a survey for a um, newly ill and disabled cohort that um, Senior and Disability Action and Detroit Disability Power are working on. So please share that and take care and take action, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you, bye-bye.